Today's guest is Dinesh D'Souza, a best-selling author, award-winning filmmaker, and what I would call an investigative political commentator. Today, Dinesh and I have an important conversation about what we're witnessing in the United States, including attacks on ideals and freedoms that this nation was founded on, uh, and unfortunately, that have created hatred and severely divided Americans, undermined trust in institutions and fellow citizens, and now, uh, in my view, threatens the essence of the United States that has made it a country where millions want to come. Where do we go from here? will be the way we end the podcast. Thanks for joining us and stay tuned. Dinesh D'Souza, welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Happy to have you be able to take some time out and talk to us. Uh, I thought I'd start with asking about your own personal history. You came here from Mumbai uh, as an as a exchange student and of course, rapidly became very prominent. I, I, I want to get on sort of out of this, why you came here. I mean, we're talking, you know, f- almost 50 years ago. Uh, let's, let's hear about your journey. Well, I grew up in, in Mumbai, then called Bombay. And I had a lot of exposure to America through movies I, and uh, books and music. So it was a far away perspective and obviously a perspective filtered through the lens of Hollywood and, and so on. And it was also probably a little dated. It wasn't it wasn't the America of the 1970s, but probably the America of the late 50s and 60s. That's the America that was transmitted through pop culture in India. So I was fascinated by America, but knew nothing about it. And then one day a fellow came to my school and said, hey, we've got this exchange program. It's sponsored by the Rotary Club. You could spend a year studying in America. And so I talked to my parents about it and they were they were like, wow, Dinesh, this is fascinating. It's very different than kind of what we had in mind. But um, but it's probably going to be a very good experience for you. And so that's how I came as an exchange student. Uh, incredibly, by a series of you know coincidences and also my own aspirations, I ended up at Dartmouth a year later, this time enrolled as a normal student um, at this Ivy League college. Uh, and let's remember, this was 1980. So this was when the, the Reagan era was beginning. Uh, and it was at Dartmouth that I caught the Reagan bug. And it really changed my life because it focused my attention sure. away from you know, I'd come to study economics and uh, probably end up in the business world, but uh, I became, de- I got deflected into the political arena. Yes, but you did fo- co-found the Dartmouth Review, which of course became uh, a landmark really among uh, college students who had a conservative leaning. What what generated that? Well, what happened was I was writing for the daily newspaper called the Daily Dartmouth, and I fell in with a group of conservative students, and we would hang out. and And I wasn't I didn't think of myself as political at that time. I was just buddies with these guys. But I realized that there was an intellectual like depth and sophistication to them that that just blew me away. I mean, these were people who would talk about Solzhenitsyn and Hayek, and they would talk about economic theory and the differences between capitalist and socialist societies. They talked about liberal education and liberal learning. Who should be a member of a liberal community? Should one be tolerant of of intolerance? All this sort of stuff. And I was like, you know, this is not our classroom fair. I'm like, where are you? Where are you guys getting all this? I mean, you you have answers to things that I didn't even know were questions. And so I suddenly started to think and read um, and explore this sort of uh, philosophical. And uh, so I came to conservatism in an intellectual way through uh, a group of quite serious students that inspired me to ask, what is it that I believe? And then I realized, look, it's not that I'm quote becoming a conservative. I always have been. Uh, it was more the recognition that these are things that I've believed, but now I have a more firm intellectual grounding for them. Right. And I think, of course, as as many of us know who work at universities like myself, that, that publication uh, has become a standard bearer and spawned many other publications, including right here at Stanford, the Stanford Review. It's very important, as you obviously know, to foster independent thinking 
not necessarily conservative thought, but simply critical thinking among young people. I think that's one of the biggest problems. It's one of the biggest voids today in our society. But I want to then make the segue from that part of your life to your one of your early books, which was in 2003. You wrote a book called Letters to a Young Conservative. And you talked uh, in a very enlightening way about these concepts like a, particularly affirmative action uh, being important as a way to bring people up or feminism and how these are uh, myths really and often destructive. Um, how, how important was that book? And as a corollary question, how have these myths fared today? I mean, we're talking 20 years ago. And I, I think we're seeing a lot of problems from those concepts. Yeah, absolutely. There was uh, a lot of interest in uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s in first principles. Uh, and by first principles, I mean, if you said, I'm a conservative, someone would go, well, what is it you're trying to conserve? Um, and if you answered tradition, they would immediately come back and say, well, I mean, Slavery was a tradition. Anti-Semitism is a tradition. These are very old traditions. Is that what you're trying to conserve, Dinesh? So I, I kind of came of age at a time when you had to think through this kind of stuff. And you began. Mm -hmm. So then I would, uh, ha I realized in that book, I need to tell young people that what we are trying to conserve in America is the principles of the American founding which is a paradox because the American founding was classically liberal. It was a liberal event in the classical sense. So we are a special type of conservative because we are conserving, oddly enough, a revolutionary tradition. We're different than the European conservatives who say, oh, you know, France has a long history of monarchy and aristocracy, and we're just trying to conserve the old, the ancien regime, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I saw this book as trying to introduce young people to basic ways of thinking about issues like feminism uh, so that it's not just examined in a policy sense, but at the ground, the simple question like, are men and women different? Uh, are, is there some legitimacy to having gender or sex roles in a society? Is this a case where culture should follow biology? Those kinds of questions and get people to think about it. So the book is written in a very sprightly conversational tone, but it's, the issues are quite fundamental. And I've got to say, we're, we're still living with them now. Absolutely. I mean, I particularly look at and had a conversation last night with someone who uh, I won't name, but uh, about feminism and this idea that you pointed out in that book that somehow uh, there's a higher value in working uh, rather than having a family. In, in, in a sense, I'm oversimplifying, but I think that it goes into what I think we're seeing today, which is a sort of an attack on all traditions of the United States and, and you might say of Western civilization, including the family, uh, including the value of having children and, uh, you know, the freedoms that this nation was founded on. And I, and I think when you do attack these traditional values, and I'm using traditional values for lack of a better way to say it. But when you attack these things, um, you I think that there's there's a creation of a of a very divisive force in and among Americans, and that's really uh, that's a problem. You, you can't have a country where everybody hates everybody else who disagrees with them, and coupling that. Uh, you know, the undermining of trust in your fellow citizens goes to undermining trust in the institutions. So in a funny way, and I said, I said this in the introduction, you know, somehow we are risking the destruction of the very society that immigrants come here for. Uh, and, and, you know, this, the irony of that, it's a self-destruction, uh, I, and I, I just wonder, I don't even know what the question is among all that, but I'd like to hear your thoughts and reaction. Uh, let me offer two thoughts. One is that uh, when, um, when I was involved in politics in my younger years, I thought of politics as a, an argument among two camps, the left and the right, about um, shared goals, but uh, unshared means. 
So it was like, we all agree, should America be strong? Yes. Should America be prosperous? Yes. Should America be an example to the world? Yes. Um, everyone agreed on this. So we know where we're going to go. We're all going, let's say, for example, to Chicago. Now, we're arguing about, should we take the bus? <laughs> should we take the train? Um, in other words, what's the best mechanism to get there? Or, for example, once the country creates a prosperous pie, how should who should get a, a, a bigger slice or a smaller slice of the pie? But that, that our economic policy should be driven toward mass prosperity. There was no disagreement about that. The key difference to me now is that we disagree on goals. Uh, and this is where the sort of antipathy comes from, because where we want to go up, they want to go down. Where we want to go to Chicago, they want to go to Maine. And so it's not a matter of whether we take the bus. We, we don't agree on where we should be headed. And in fact, many of the values that our side cherishes, they want to actively destroy. So this is, I think you're right, this is a different kind of challenge. And this is in some ways a formula for a society to unravel because it's difficult to be fellow citizens with a group of people who want to essentially destroy your core values, if not grab a hold of you and lock you in prison, if they could. Uh, so right. this is, I think, where we are. And it's, it is very unfortunate. Now, um, how we got from there to here is a whole other question. But I think the roots of it have to do with the gangsterization of the Democratic Party. Whatever you think of the Democratic Party in the age of Dukakis or Mondale or Carter, or of course, going further back, JFK, Truman, it wasn't a party of gangsters. Uh, it was a party of progressives, of liberals, the great society. Uh, but I think starting with Obama and continuing with Hillary, continuing with Biden, we have a, a kind of a, a gangster strain uh, that we are now dealing with. And, and frankly, most Republicans are ill-equipped to even see that because they still think we're living in some version of the Reagan era. Yeah, there's another pair, uh, sort of interesting thing that I, I find myself thinking about quite a bit. I grew up in Chicago in a, a low-income family, basically, a very working, lower working class, I would say, socioeconomically. But in those days, this was the original Mayor Daley days of Chicago, the, the Democrat Party was the party of the sort of populist mode, the... the uh, sort of blue collar worker uh, and the elites were the affluent Republicans in the North shore of Chicago, I'll say for those listeners who understand what that means. Nowadays, it seems to be flipped as many things have in my view, the political parties now have become the elites of America are generally in the Democrat party whether it's a Hollywood elite, a political elite, the university elites, it doesn't necessarily mean the rich only. Uh, and the working blue collar Democrat of my childhood is now sort of the working blue collar Republican and in fact, the sort of the Trump supporter. Uh, the populist uh, term applies to the Republican now more than the American a Democrat. And that, that's sort of an interesting flip. And similarly, the, the religion question. You have become uh, or have been uh, an outspoken person on many topics, including the defender of, of Christianity and, and religion, I think, in general. Um, and this has been I've witnessed and we've all witnessed the secularization of America, where this has become a dirty word to be a Christian. I wasn't from a, a religious background at all, but the values are sort of overlapping quite a bit with simply family values that I was raised in. And now we see this is a very, uh, a culture very seemingly antagonistic to religion. What, what do you think about that and where, where uh, how, how harmful is that to our basic values and cohesiveness as a society? Well, a lot of people don't realize that the world before Christianity was a very uh, dark place with regard to many of the kind of core moral values that even secular people share in our society today. In other words, many of the values that we consider secular were built on a Christian foundation. They're the, they've been transmitted through Christian education over the decades and over the centuries. So for example, uh, human life uh, in the pre-Christian world 
uh, was very ambiguous in terms of its intrins intrinsic value. Even the greatest philosophers of ancient Greece thought it quite normal, for example, to take a defective child and kill it. Uh, the Spartans, of course, did this famously by leaving the sick child on the hillside and find it dead in the morning. But you'll notice that none of the great Greek philosophers who knew about this objected to this practice because just the simple notion that human life is, is sacred, it's precious. And again, we're not talking about life in the womb. We're talking about life in general. Um, mm -hmm. So the sacralization, the attaching of, you may almost say, infinite value the, to, to, uh, to, to human life, human dignity, uh, and all our rights come out of that. I mean, this is something that even Jefferson, who had his doubts about Orthodox Christianity, nevertheless, Jefferson had no doubt uh, that the notion that all men are created equal is a kind of a theological claim, because it's not a claim that can be supported empirically or sociologically. Human beings are obviously vastly different in size and strength and speed and perhaps even in moral character. So it's only if you step back and go, well, yeah, but human beings are equal in the eyes of God. That was the theological presupposition that led to a political conclusion. And think about it, the founding, the Civil War, I mean, the huge events of American history are all based upon that kind of root conception. Even when Martin Luther King said, you know, I'm submitting a promissory note and I'm demanding that it be cashed. It would be a very good question to ask King, well, what's the note? What note? Did the Southern segregationists give you some kind of a note? No, he was appealing to the promises in the Declaration of Independence. So you think of the irony of Martin Luther King. He's appealing to the charter written by a Southern planter, Jefferson, and basically saying, I'm claiming the rights that were put forward by this Virginia slave owner. Right. I mean, you know, we, we see all these problems today and, and this is, uh, you know, the, the lack of cohesion in society, I think is, is, is one of the biggest ones, I think. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not certain this can be overcome so, so quickly, but I'd like to hear what your view is on what is the biggest problem today. And, you know, whether it's on campus, the, the K through 12 educational system, uh, the attack on religion, the attack on on traditional families, the you know the reversal of merit as a basis uh, uh, and a goal of having achievement. I mean, I, I'd like to sort of go big picture. Uh, what what's the what's the big problem here? I mean, in, in a sense, it could be simply the the flow of information uh, as a general thread. I, I I think you know we've seen the decimation of trust in the media, deservedly so. And of course, we all get our information essentially from the media in some form. Well, where, where do you think about the, uh, where do you put these in your perspective? Well, I, I would put it uh, a little differently. I, I think that if we think about the era of the American founding, the founding was based upon three interlocking principles, uh, three different types of freedom, economic freedom, uh, political freedom, and you could, you could call it civic uh, freedom or freedom of thought and expression. Loosely speaking, those are the, that's the sort of tripod of freedoms on which the founding is based. The founding is also based on, on something more implicit that is not stated in the founding quite as blatantly, but is there. And that is the notion that there is an external moral order in the universe that we didn't create but that is there and makes claims on us. In other words, that there is an independent notion of right or wrong. Uh, and it's not merely a subjective, I, this is what I think, or this is how I feel. It is sort of built into the structure of reality itself. So now if you look at what's going on today, you notice that there is a rejection both of the fundamental freedom side and of the external moral order. So it's, it is a wholesale rejection of the principles on which the founding was based. And I think this is the root of our, this is really what we're fighting about because modern American conservatism, as I understand it, is about freedom, but it is about freedom not as an end in itself, but it is, uh, it is about freedom as a means to secure, you can call it the American dream or the good society. Freedom is a way to get there. So if you were to tell the American founders, why should we have freedom? They would say, well, it's so you can live the good life, so you can have healthy families and healthy communities and, uh, and, 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 and an attachment to God and to country. This is the America we envision for all the citizens, ultimately. And so, however, there is a completely sort of 
there is a rebel notion of America that has now gathered force and taken over the key institutions. And so we're fighting about we're not fighting about things on the on the periphery. We're fighting about things very fundamental about the meaning of America. Yeah, I mean, I think that that that's absolutely right. I, I couldn't agree more. There, and I think what we've witnessed is a deterioration of a moral compass. Uh, and and I think, you know, these these principles of right versus wrong, they don't depend on even on, on in my view on religion or anything other than simply the fundamental idea that virtue and a virtuous life uh, is worth having. And uh, given that, I feel very disappointed, uh, particularly that was exposed during the pandemic, frankly, that there's a lack of moral courage as well. It, it's a, there's a misguided nature of, what, uh, of the importance of morality and ethical living. But a lot of that hinges on having the courage to go and say it and and show others what that really means. And I'm I'm I personally have been very disappointed, not so much in the leadership, not so much in the media, because my expectation was so low that, that they they couldn't have disappointed me. But average people, regular people, I found uh, were missing in action, and I and I'm I'm very concerned about that. Uh, that that may sound very pessimistic, but uh, you know we all know, and I think you you've taken your lumps uh, uh, by speaking out. Uh, but you know the life worth living depends on people speaking out. Well, courage is the um, courage is the primary virtue for the simple reason that it is the ingredient that gives you the strength to do all the other ones. Um, right. If you didn't have courage then the other virtues uh, become immobilized because somebody can cow you into backing down from exercising any of them, even the ones you have. But so, and yet courage is somewhat rare. I say this because, I mean, I'm, I think historically of the example that when Henry VIII uh, asked the Catholic priests of England uh, who overwhelmingly disagreed with his proclamation to sort of sign here, and if you refuse to sign, you will be executed. Nine out of ten signed, which is to say that you can by and large call it the rule of ten. Out of ten people, if you're going to going to go on a, on a random basis, you're going to by and large find one that is so anchored in their moral principles that they will not give in no matter what. But but that is a rarity. The majority right. of people are going to be, you can push them. And the left knows this, which is why, I think this is really why they've moved away from the freedom principle, because they've realized if we control the institutions, we can sort of cajole and arm wrestle and bully these people because uh, ultimately they're, they're going to yield if we apply enough pressure, enough carrots, enough sticks. Uh, and obviously, now, if you push that principle far enough, it leads to the Gulag archipelago, and we are not there yet, and I'm not suggesting we're even close to being to that point, but we are moving in that direction. There's no question about it, and COVID was just a small, like a little tyrannical window uh, into how you get there. Right, and I think that, you know, one of the one of the ways to overcome that scenario you've outlined is speaking out because when individuals the few individuals that have the courage to speak out to stand for what is obviously right uh i think it empowers people who are sort of wavering bordering they not everybody can be the tip of the spear and, and that's okay but uh and I think you you've seen this in your in your whole life. I've seen it also with your original views as a student. I'm sure that when you speak out, all of a sudden other students, other people say, "Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. I I can speak out too." So I think this is very very important as we speak to young people. And I hope that there are some young people listening to this. I think that's one of the big lessons. Uh, you know, is that it's valuable to speak out, not just to get the view heard but to empower other people uh, to speak out. We used to have, I want to talk, go ahead. I was just going to say, we, we used to have a saying at the Dartmouth Review that taking on our newspaper is like wrestling with a pig because not only does it get everyone dirty, 
but the pig likes it. Now, I mentioned this <laughs> because, because there is a, if you can go beyond the courage to speak out and take a certain relish of the amusement, uh, use weapons of ridicule, have fun in the fight, it actually makes the whole thing far more enjoyable and it draws people to your side. We'd have lots of people who would come up to us and even the cowards, you know, at Dartmouth, they'd be like, you know, I wouldn't really join the Dartmouth Review and so on. My girlfriend would stop talking to me and so on. But I really enjoy what you guys are doing. You know, keep it up, man. You guys look at like having so much fun. So creating a certain environment in which you uh, recognize that it's sometimes a little bit of a dire situation. But guess what? You know what? We're going to we're going to make this a fun fight and we're going to enjoy taking part in it. Uh, So what what becomes necessary to do also becomes enjoyable to do. Right. Now, it's just very important to get people, uh, you know, to to join the join the mix. I, I want to mention uh, in and talk about the sort of latest Orwellian dystopian uh, thing to arise. And that is this world of AI in what's coming out with artificial intelligence, which seemingly uh is able to rewrite history, to rewrite fact, to distort. And, and I'm very concerned with this. Uh, wh- what are you thinking about what, was, what is being exposed now about these AI algorithms, et cetera? Well, think of the way that when the, when the internet first came around, it had so much promise. And it, it not only offered a uh, unlimited horizons of knowledge, but uh, an access to knowledge uh, worldwide. Uh, but it also offered a way to get around the sort of oligopoly uh, of the mainstream media. It offered all those things. And, and, and no one would have foreseen, or at least I didn't foresee, that you would see the emergence of a tech regime in coordination with each other. Uh, that would become, in a way, worse than the New York Times, you know, that would be actually, act- at least the New York Times, anyone can subscribe. But the idea of actively throwing people off of YouTube and shutting their channel down after they've spent years building it up. I mean, the the ruthlessness, the idiocy, the the, the sort of the, the barbarism that has uh, now emerged in, within the sort of tech community. It's very scary and very frightening. And some of these people started right. out as, as libertarians. Yeah, as a, as opposed to being the promise of free access to information and more is better, it relatively quickly became a tool to censor and filter and distort information. I, I think it was I, okay. I, I have to say, I also I never foresaw that at all. I, I had no concept that this could be abused and misused. And now we see the uh, as we're mentioning this AI, these algorithms actively putting forward complete falsehoods as if it were fact. And it's, it's very frightening because, you know, we have a younger generation, it, not just the whole society, but really particularly the young people under 30 who are wholly dependent on technology for their source of information. Well, when you, I don't know where this goes. Yeah, when you consider the power of companies like Google, the ability that where they control your ability to search information, uh, they are... Uh, they seem determined not only to alter the present, but also to alter the past. Uh, and uh, and who knows if we can trust anything that they say in the future. So what's happening- I mean, this is right out of George Orwell. This is beyond anything that Orwell wrote, although it's very uh, clearly in parallel with 1984. Yes, and, and not only that, but I mean, Orwell has been read for the past 50 years as a dystopian warning. But it almost looks like for some people, it's like a handbook. It's sort of like, okay, right. let's read Orwell to find out some new stuff that we can now pull uh, in order to achieve the social change. So to me, it's hard to, to see. I don't know if a lot of these guys received a purely technical education, have no knowledge of history, of moral reasoning, because you get that impression. You get the idea that these people like Zuckerberg, when, when I look at Zuckerberg, I feel like I'm looking at a, a human robot, uh, a guy who has sort of no moral dimension to him. I mean, sure, he likes to take an ax and smash into something, or he wants to go cage fight with somebody, but, but he's a moral retard. And so you've got a guy with tremendous power, 
uh, who is running a giant corporation, which has, you know, has the has the power of a small country. And 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 yet these are the people that now can unleash this kind of power on us. And we are terrifyingly at the receiving end of it. So AI just ratchets up that process one one more. Yeah, I mean, I, I and I'm not I'm not very convinced on how to solve it. I there's a lot of noise about having oh the government has to weigh in and restrict or whatever. I I, I I'm very concerned about that as any kind of solution. I, I don't trust people in government or out of government, frankly, to be the arbiters of how these things should should work. Uh, so I I don't see that as a as a as a fruitful pathway to achieving truth or legitimate objectivity. I, I, and, I, and I don't know the solution. Uh, I mean, we always say, oh, okay, more competition, alternative. I think that's true, but that's part of it. But I, I'm, not, I'm not very optimistic that this is going to be solved. I don't know how you, you feel well, about Well, I that. mean, the, you know, certainly in terms of classical kind of market theory, antitrust would be part of the solution. Because think about something like Parler. Parler started off as an alternative platform. It was actually growing extremely fast. Uh, and, and it was doing very well. And then there was a coordinated attack on Parler that came from Amazon. It came from Apple. Uh, essentially, the tech giants got together and said, let's crush Parler. And they did it in coordination. Now, that's not allowed. I mean, you should not be able as a quasi-monopoly to gang up on somebody who is trying to enter, uh, if you will, the market and compete with you right. and you put them out of business. Now, that's what antitrust laws, are. if they're not for that, I don't know what, why we have them at all. So, of course. Uh, but for antitrust to work, you've got to have an administration that's committed to enforcing the antitrust laws. And part of the problem becomes when you've got a, an existing regime, in this case, the Biden administration, that is not only okay with the censorship going on, but wants more. They actually want to. They would well, they were actively up. involved in it. Yeah, actively involved yes, in it. Yes, exactly. I mean, I have to say, uh, although it's frightening that we're a society that depends on a very small number of billionaires, uh, at least we have one that cares about free speech, Elon Musk. So uh hate to have that much burden on him to come up with the competitive products and things that are going to are going to be very helpful here but I I mean that that is I think part of the reality of the solution. Uh a couple of things before I w- I want to talk I would be remiss in not bringing up your 2000 mules and the election integrity issue with you. Uh and it's it, it okay in my view the the question at this point isn't whether or not an election was stolen. Uh, Everyone knows the election was clearly manipulated before the election took place by virtue of the media, the inundation, the cover-up of the Biden uh, laptop, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want to, I don't want to waste time on that because now we're dealing with what to do about stuff like that. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are on how to really ensure election integrity, because without that, we, we don't really have a country. Yeah, I agree. I think that the problem is not so much in uh, things like early voting. Uh, some Republicans are focused on that as the problem. We need to have a single election day, Dinesh. It's all got to be on one day and should be a national holiday. Well, look, um, I don't think that's the problem. In fact, it's a good idea to make it easy for people to vote and give them a couple of weeks in which they can do early voting. And then you have election day. Uh, and uh, that's how you skip the big lines and so on. But the problem has to do with very bad voter rolls. Because think about it, a substantial amount of Americans move um, on, on a pretty regular basis. Right. I mean, I, I have lived in, 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 in my in the past 40 years in about six different places in America. So if it is the case that when I go to Dartmouth, uh, I'm somehow on the rolls in New Hampshire. And then when I move to New York, I'm in the New York rolls. But no one's taken me off the rolls in New Hampshire. Then I move to California and I'm on the rolls there. The point is not that I'm going to be voting seven times. But the point is that there is now a voter on the rolls that anybody who wants to cheat in the system can vote their vote. In other words, there is now a right. vulnerability because when a vote comes Absolutely. in, let's say by absentee ballot, they look the guy up, oh yeah, he's on the rolls. So bad voter rolls is part of it. Uh, during COVID, there was, there was very inadequate surveillance on drop boxes. 
you know, if you're going to have mail-in drop boxes, and I'm not in principle opposed to them. Now, I do think that because of Zuckerberg's influence and so on, they were strategically located where Democrats vote. Uh, and there were far fewer of them where Republicans vote. So that's another way you unlevel a playing field. You basically facilitate the vote in heavily Democratic areas, uh, and you don't in comparable Republican areas. But nevertheless, if you're going to have mail-in drop boxes, you need to have surveillance. As it is, mail-in voting is more vulnerable for obvious reasons. You go in to right. vote, you show an ID, you're behind the curtain, there's nothing you can do to kind of uh, you know, finagle the system. Quite frankly, if I were to tell the guys when I go in to vote, hey guys, I've got an errand to run, let me take my ballot with me, I'll come back, it'll be all filled out. They'd be like, no way, you can't do that. But that's exactly what happens with an absentee ballot. It goes out, nobody knows who opens the envelope, Nobody knows who fills out the ballot. Nobody knows who signs the ballot. Nobody ho knows who delivers the ballot. So the bottom line of it is you've got a process that is at the very least more susceptible to fraud. Uh, and therefore, it's reasonable to believe that if there's fraud, this is one area where it's likely to take place. Right. Well, we'll see what happens, but I'm not very optimistic that the perception of the next election will be that it was fair no matter who wins, no matter who loses. And I think in, in that sense, uh, we, we need to figure out how to, how to enhance the integrity so in a very visible way, uh, because we need to trust the elections. For sure. I mean, that, that's obvious to everybody. But look, I mean, part of the problem is that, Scott, and this is quite apart from 2000 mules and so on, they come out in 2020 when we know that this was a, an anomalous election. They changed all the rules. They were accepting absentee ballots three days after the election was closed in Pennsylvania. You know, and, and yet they say with a straight face, this is the most secure election in American history. Now, think right. about the, the sheer chutzpah and, and absurdity of that statement, because at the very least, you'd be like, all right, if it's the most secure election in history, Show me a com comparison of the 2020 election with 2016, 2012, 2008, and back, so on. Show me that the volume of fraud in 2020 was less than in all those previous elections. And the point is not only that no one successfully did that, no one even attempted it. So the fact no. that they were lying to our face about it, I mean, it is it is the lies of the regime that are sowing the seeds of distrust. And so if you want to have more trust, stop lying to us in this blatant fashion. Right. I mean, I think transparency and honesty, of course, go a long way. The problem is going back to the question of the lack of integrity. I, I personally, you know, I was in Washington for only a few months uh, but what I saw, and as particularly with the media, the reporting, the, the whole field of investigative journalism has been completely uh, undermined by its own lack of integrity. And, and I think when you have something like that, uh, it brings us to what to do to fix things. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm always thinking of this, I, I co-founded uh, an institute that is directed at getting ethical people into journalism, into uh, fields that are very important, including private corporations, finance. It's not just the government. We need to restore the attention to an ethical society. Uh, you know, and I think that's a that, that's sort of a broad, uh, maybe uh, la impractical way to articulate it. But I wonder what your, it, it, in, a, in a way to finish this, what are your ideas for how to fix things, not just short term, but, you know, in the intermediate and long term, because we cannot pass on to our children the country in the shape it's in? I, I agree. Um, and it's also, I mean, for me, this has been a little uh, traumatic in the sense that, you know, for most of my career, I thought of America, we're the free world. They're the unfree world. We are the good guys. They are the bad guys. And, and now I realize that, that every time I, I start saying those things, I, I bring myself up short because I'm like, I'm not sure we're the free world in the sense that I understood it anymore. And, um, and, and, and this rot is not simply a matter of biased journalists and left-wing professors. I mean, look at the corrosion of our justice system uh, in which, right. uh, again, it's not even left-wing judges. You will have juries uh, that will inflict uh, absolutely catastrophic verdicts on people 
seemingly for no reason other than they don't like their political views. And, and if this becomes pervasive, and it has to, because if one side is doing it, the other side is going to start doing it soon. So then you, what, right. what happens is you, get, you basically get a jury where you go in for judicial assassination no matter what. Uh, and it just becomes, uh, the whole system becomes, becomes uh, untrustworthy. And it's, we're pretty close to that right now. So I'm not absolutely we we are we are we are really behaving in many ways we meaning the American justice system very much like these societies that we abhor exactly these third world countries uh, that are completely corrupt as well as these authoritarian countries that we were always standing in complete contrast with and I, and I think this is very concerning it is. And, and ultimately, uh, it may start in the political domain. So, for example, right now, you could be targeted as a Republican, as a Trumpster, as a conservative. Uh, but if you stay out of politics, there's, there's no obvious way in, you, you would, in which you would be targeted. But it will quickly spill out into those things as well. So you go from political vendettas to social vendettas. Uh, and so then you begin to, to, to feel the full... Uh, corrosion of the system. So again, uh, you know, we're a long way from having completely disintegrated as a society, but our direction is certainly very, very bad. And and look at the look at how much things have unwound in just the Biden years. Uh, I mean, I thought things were getting it reaching a troubling point under Obama, but some of that gangsterization that I mentioned earlier has gone to a completely different level. Uh, under under Biden. So if, if we don't stop it now, it's it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll have to see what happens. I don't think it will be solved in any single election or in any short term period. Uh, but I know one thing is that if we don't call it out, if we don't speak about it, if we don't recognize it and state the obvious, uh, it, it's the country's finished. So we, we need to be bold enough. We need to get people. Uh, a little bit uh, more courageous in stepping up and in uh, really teaching our children and the and the young people coming up that uh, there's a country worth fighting for. There are ideals uh, that need to be in place. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sort of semi-optimistic that we'll be able to do that. Probably the most important thing is to have a, um, a kind of invigorated, um, and newly galvanized um, right or Republican Party, because ultimately it would be very tragic if we lost the country because one party uh, actively sought to destroy it and the other party was too timid, too cowardly to do what is necessary to save it. Yes. Well, uh, I, guess the, I guess the question remains unanswered at this point, but we, we keep fighting. Well, Dinesh... Uh, D'Souza, thank you so much for all the time today and uh, hearing your interesting thoughts on these issues. There's so much to talk about. I, I hope to have you back. I look forward to it. Thank you. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Dinesh D'Souza, check out his website, DineshD'Souza.com. Listen to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast or read his many books and watch his films. And don't forget Please subscribe to this show on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.